So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so we're going to sit, but Barbara feels like she wants to stand. So, um, I want to stand so that I can point to different yes. things and people can. So we were going to kind of do a conversation. I guess I wanted to maybe first have you tell a little bit about your early life. Um, before you came to St. Louis, and um, then kind of we can weave our way through. And, and uh, so I think people would love to have a little bit of history. In the first place, I'm suffering this morning a great deal from amnesia. Because, uh, <laughs> last night I stayed awake all night thinking of the wonderful things I was going to say, and of course it's all gone. <laughs> I think the 890 gives you a chance to look back and to think about your own life and the fortune of having a lot of luck and a lot of support from a wonderful pair of parents and a sister and a housekeeper and the business of making art, not painting, but music and reading and philosophy and everything that was um, fun and to get a time which was during the depression when people didn't have little things that they could keep checking out like on. They didn't have a lot of, uh, there was no television of course. We had a radio, I didn't have any record players. But we had many, many books and we read it out loud to each other. We read silently, I read under the blankets when the lights were supposed to be out. And uh, it was a very interesting home life. My mother was a graduate from the New England Conservatory of Music at an age when uh, that wasn't very common. My father was a radiologist who uh, had a private uh, portable unit and he would take it to people's homes. If they couldn't afford to pay in money, they would pay in books. And so we had many books all over the place. <laughs> That chapter ended with the beginning of World War II, um, and my father decided that he wasn't going to wave a flag on Boylston Street, he was going to go into the service, which he did. And so that chapter ended with us moving to some unknown place called St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a brief period of time, because St. Louis was a deployment center, uh, but in the brief time that we were here, we because after the war was over and he returned, he decided that's where he wanted to live. And he had a wonderful position here, and uh, we all moved here. Um, I would say that I lasted about uh, a year and a half, about two years, uh, when I decided I, my sister and I would have to leave and go to New York and find our fame and fortune. <laughs> and my roommate decided to come with us. So my father bought all of us the exact same suits to go looking for a job, the three gray suited women. <laughs> anyway, we were very, very lucky, even in New York. And it was a time when, it, when New York was simply gray. When two of us went to Young and Budapan, and uh, uh, my roommate Julie became a stringer for Walter Winchell. Oh. I stayed with Young and Budapan for about a year and a half. And my sister was in the television department of Young and Fam, and I wanted to be in that same department. But I got married and had a baby, and they decided that was not for me. The baby would get sick, and I would have to leave and stay home and take care of it, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I got all dressed up and went, up Madi went down Madison Avenue and uh, went directly over to CBS where they decided to take the at that time, news was broadcast from the United Nations out of Lake Success in uh, Long Island. It was very exciting and so forth, but I wanted to be in the drama department, and so that's where I went. But it was in the comedic department with Gary Moore. And uh, at that time, we were on the air every single day from 1.30 to 2.30, and I don't know if we ever watched that at the time. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And uh, I would say that the year 2025, when my husband decided to uh, leave New York, where he was doing a, uh, an internship, because he had a residency. Where was that residency? And I got here, and it took me quite a while to see what do you do here. I went on to ASD and the director was the producer, the producer was the cameraman. They didn't have any <laughs> And one day, uh, I heard about a woman named Leona Cooper, and then she was going to give some classes in water coloring. So <coughs> I decided to go do that. 
And lo and behold, I thought I really liked it. And that was somewhat the beginning. The beginning. A long career in the painting. That's the early part. <laughs> Well, I did go to the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri to begin with that, so uh, that was what led me to be able to get into the young and the and the satellites. But the, the, the next chapter in my life was, was really dynamic, because my husband and I decided that we wanted to see a lot of the world. And uh, the world is a pretty big place, and what I made the mistake of doing was to go to Europe first. And uh, the reason I say that is because, in reality, there are so many more interesting and unusual places to start with that you no longer can go to. And uh, if I were to ever do that again, I probably would start in Persepolis in Graham. And uh, you certainly can't do that now. And anyway, we went to one of the places, but the place that struck a chord was India is a, uh, a country that uh, provides you with the, the whole gamut of life. The rich, the medium, the rich, the poor, and the devastated. But in addition to that, the surrounding terrain is so astounding. And when I got to the Himalayas uh, and went, went quite a way up, um, it was so enormous. It is so obstacle, and it's humongous, it's, it's just beyond belief. And so I took that back with me into the studio, and I thought about it a lot. And um, I want to say one thing, that anybody who paints, anybody who is an artist has mentors, whether you're a writer or a composer or a painter or whatever. And uh, I had a number, well, Matisse was certainly a great mentor for me as well as Picasso. Uh, but when I saw Andy Warhol's can of tomato soup, I thought that is the most astounding for today. Because what it said was, this is America. And I thought about that a lot. Uh, and I decided that that's not what I wanted to say about America. What I wanted to say was what is happening in the world and what is the plight of life. And uh, don't forget that um, I was already by this time turning very old. So <laughs> at an old person's point of view. And that's not so bad. What you understand then, you don't understand while you're on the road to going somewhere. And having been on the road, <coughs> going somewhere, I can look back and I can see the struggle, the difficulties that people have. And so I decided to do the Himalayas and use them as a metaphor for obstacles in life and how they seem so huge to each of us when we look and see when we're young and we're looking out and trying to get somewhere. And so, Today, I'll start with this painting here because today I think there is a huge trend which is equal and more so than the trend of World War II. And that is migration. So wherever you go in the world, people are moving. They are leaving their world. They are trying to leave their world. So gladly. And so I have depicted this rugged terrain, uh, and it certainly is rugged, uh, and the anxious people who are, I would say, in exodus. They are leaving the world that they know, and maybe even leaving it for good. I have two moons in the painting, representing almost the impossible, but the view the possibility is out there that they can go somewhere else, even to another planet, if need be. So that painting also was finished this year, 
Uh, it was almost wet when we brought it over here. <laughs> so it was the last meeting I did. And because of the subject matter, I tempered the palette to meet the subject matter. So it is a kind of a gray palette. And even the moons don't have much life for them. Because I see that we're living in a very strange period of time. And uh, I must say that coming down from Sikkim in India to Darjeeling, thank you very much, it, coming down from Sikkim to Darjeeling, what you see is a great number of trees which have been chopped down for warmth, uh, for whatever the reasons. And so a lot of the terrain, the, 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 uh, uh, the roadway, if you want to call it that, is clouded and, and congested with the detritus because when you chop down trees, there's nothing to hold the land back. So that's sort of that painting. The next one to it is uh, a painting that uh, where there is a ladder. The ladder is a difficult ladder to climb up. And it, uh, it says that when you get to a certain height, you've got to get on another ladder and go up further. It's harder. You have to keep going in order to reach your goal. And whatever that goal is, it could be the goal of aging. It could be the goal of learning. It could be the goal of enlightenment. It could be the goal of success. And uh, further on down, we'll talk about that again. The yellow painting is another expression, a earlier expression. Uh, I think that was 82, 83 when I did that one. And it is the mountain in the background and the bridge over which people are crossing into another sphere. And they're being knocked off, pushed off, uh, in order for the person behind to make way. And uh, so the subject matter in these obstacle paintings is somewhat grim, but I use the palette to make it beautiful, to make it <coughs> light, filled with light and filled with some energy. And, uh, and it doesn't feel grim to me. Um, the one next to it is a kind of astounding thing. The name of that mountain is Kenchanjonga. And Kenchanjonga is the mountain of the five gods. You never hear of anybody climbing that mountain, and you won't feel that way climbing that mountain because it is considered sacred. Uh, one morning in Darjeeling, we were awakened at 4 o'clock and we took our van and went up close to the place called Tiger Hill. And once at Tiger Hill, we thought at this hour of the morning we were going to be alone. When we got there, there was a scaffolding with maybe hundreds of people. And the scaffolding was, was just bars that were connected, but people all the way up. Not a sound. No one heard a sound. It was, it was quiet. It was mystical. And there stood Kenjanjonga. Now I had flown past Kenjanjonga earlier, maybe two, two years earlier. It took a half an hour to get past it by plane. So while we're standing there, this tiny little sliver of lipstick red appeared over the mountain. And as it came up, that sun was like a ball of fire. And it cast this beautiful rosy hue across the jagged hills of that particular mountain. And at that point, out of the mouths of those hundreds of people hanging off that scaffolding, it was ooh, ooh. It was an experience that was so uh, sacred in its own way. And uh, I didn't photograph it at all. I just, just looked at it and just tried to take it all in. And when I got back to the studio, I did that drawing, which I like a lot. So uh, <clears throat> the next painting is about a rival and uh, a new sculpture material at the bottom to express the difficulty of arriving somewhere. But uh, there is that head at the top. Uh, people who are in business may think it's 
they break it down the glass ceiling that it's a woman, but it's endogenous. The hair goes into the mountain. It becomes one. It becomes maybe a vision of people who have arrived at a point of great learning, uh, great understanding of life, maybe. I don't know. The last painting back here of the Blue Mountain, which I have entitled The Last Look at the Mountain, I put it up here because of two reasons, and one of those reasons was it was the last painting that I wanted to do of the mountain, but of course you understand that it was done a while before this one over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, following that one is the uh, it is an attempt to show um, landscape on top of landscape. Uh, it, was, it was just a nice little thing. On this wall, I have chosen to see it and wanted to give a selection of what I call interrelationships. What we have are interrelationships. We are all jockeying, looking for the space of the sun. <clears throat> I was in Puerto Rico at an artist's house, which I have done that there. And the artist had this house sitting on top of a mountain. And there is a spine down the high country of Puerto Rico uh, with all these lovely hills and so forth. And so his terrain was going up and down. And at that home that day, there were a number of artists of all different kinds, architects as well. And uh, they had devised a system, not only with steps going up to the house, but little tiny balconies where a couple of chairs, a little table, and you could sit and look out over the hillsides and the terrain. It was really quite lovely. One here and another one down there and another one down there. And so that was very nice. And I did do a lot of photographing. And what I saw was this enormous number of plants and foliage and flowers and but they were all intertwined and they were all seemed to be pushing one another for space and for life. And so that, that expresses that. In this one here I was thinking deeply about Matisse and I uh, call it Hot House. And uh, in fact at the very bottom of that painting I have Matisse's cat. <laughs> so that's the escape that I was thinking of. The black painting here with the flowers attached is a portrait. Uh, if you remember Jim Dine's bathrobes, I never liked them because they were ugly and they didn't tell me anything except that I didn't like his work. Uh, I like the work of thinking about the inner soul. I like the idea of thinking about uh, um, what happens with that inner soul from the time you're little until everybody has worked you over, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and so that's what, that's what that was about. The family, the family albums were the loss of my family. My, my sister, my father first, my sister, and my mother. And I couldn't, uh, I, I was just totally alone. Uh, not really because I had my wonderful family, children and my husband, but my initial family was gone. And I didn't know how to handle that. And eventually I began to look over photographs of them before I had ever known them as people who were kind of strangers. And I began to think, this is just wonderful. I'm going to incorporate them in some kind of a background that I choose. And that got me thinking about uh, something other than my loss. And it got me over that uh, to an extent. This is my mother. Obviously, I didn't know her. This was on her wedding day. But I got a photograph of her. And uh, uh, I decided I would make two of her. <laughs> one giving me the eye. <laughs> and the other one just standing there. She was also a very, very accomplished uh, costume designer, uh, dress designer, and uh, she made uh, her mark over at the Museum of Boston. <coughs> and I had a number of uh, patterns that she had uh, that I found in her 
collection, and I decided I would make her bouquet out of one of those breast berries. So that was that. And this one of my dad was before the war, and then when he went into the war, and when he was in France. And uh, happily, um, he returned home, and we had a very happy life together. Uh, it's, guess where? St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
into the past, but also toward the future, and you see a dark side, and you see the... Can you stand up? I can't, I can't figure that out. You, you have a wonderful ability that's unusual in that you see a dark side and the light and figuratively or, or philosophically, as well as time. You're, you're so fluid. There's a positive and a negative. To what do you attribute that uniqueness of the, the fluidity of your, your time well, you and your, your world war two? And you know what takes time with the Japanese, for example, and the people who were in the back then walked much. If you knew about the Holocaust, if you knew, if you lived through that particular period of time, and the grimness of it, and the, and the, and the, the need for escaping, uh, there, there are people here, maybe, who had that experience, where they had to leave the town, the, the Nazis were arriving, and so forth. At the same time, if you had messages as a, as a young person where, where there was fun in your house, there was so much fun, and people were so intelligent and funny, and you grow up with that. You not growing up with wringing your hand every minute. And, uh, and it is your own personality. It's your own persona that tells you, uh, you know, with all the possibilities of life, uh, Still, you can go out and see Kenchenjunga and marvel, marvel at the gorgeousness of so many places in the United States, everywhere, everywhere. So you don't have to live a life of grimness to be aware. And anyway, I feel like a voyeur because here I am safe and sound in a place that my children have provided for me, and I feel very safe there. But at the same time, that should not shield me from being aware of what is happening in the world. It's just such a very difficult period of time we're going through. Think about the 50s with President Eisenhower. He had the most wonderful Congress. They did nothing. They didn't catch a bad thing. It was perfect. <laughs>
So I don't know whether you're coming in or going out. And, uh, but the path that we choose in life is the interesting path. And you can choose many. This is one of the things that I, I think is so important because uh, people somehow feel like they've chosen a path, they've got to stick with it. Well, alone, you don't have to stick with it. You can do what you please. You can do numbers of things. But uh, I must say, I do love to read the newspapers, and when I come across one articles that are very, very well written, or humorous, and clever, and every way, I just <coughs> sit back and say, yeah, that, that's a great article. <laughs> <laughs> or a great headline. That's another thing that was very hard. It was to be on the desk at school to write a headline was one heck of a Better than we figured out enough. Come on, ask yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Barbara. Please see what she's doing. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've been around the world quite a bit. Do you feel as though you are part of the world or you're an observer <coughs> within the world in documenting this? I really have been in many, many places uh, that has produced a sense of awareness of worldwide issues. And you could be in Spain, you could be in France, you could be in Italy, you could be the world over and think about those people who are leaving constantly in little freighters and little boats and they're, they're uh, uh, falling off into the Mediterranean to try to get to the little uh, in Pedusa or whatever that island is called uh, in Italy. And then when they get there, what's for them? Oh, they get from, from <coughs> Africa over to, over to Spain. And then they've got to climb a new bridge, a new, a new fence. And, uh, and then when they get there, they put in a hole. It, it's, just, it's just unbelievable to travel by yourself. But when you travel by yourself, you have many more interesting experiences. You're not beholden to flag that somebody holds up, like the scene is Japanese all the fall. It's, uh, it's really something else. I'm interested in thinking about the Toroko Gorge in Taiwan, a country that is very successful and uh, burgeoning with clever people uh, and inventive people. And in the center of that country, I will tell you something to begin with. <laughs> Holly had arranged, my daughter Holly had arranged this trip. And when I got out to the airport to get down to Hualien, I looked at this plane, it looked like Frank Lloyd Wright's plane. <laughs> I got a plane on that thing. So we got on a plane anyway, and I looked out the window and I see two cars, Rolls Royce. I said, I think we'll make it to see. Well, we got there, and um, um, Holly had arranged for a taxi driver. And uh, one other person, I think, who spoke uh, Chinese, uh, whatever. And we get into this taxi, and we start going into this gorge, which rose higher and higher and higher and higher. And this, uh, on these roads, you could see crosses. Well, the whole <laughs> gorge was made, was, it, it consisted of marble. And they had these little chisels, all these people with little chisels making a roadway. And they had fallen off, so they put the cross up. And it was an amazing, totally amazing place in the world. And when, when you got up to a certain height, you knew you had gone to heaven. It was just fantastic. But at the same time, there kept being avalanches, and we had to stay in an extra night. We couldn't get completely across or whatever. But these little people, dear, I keep thinking about these little people with a chiseling, chiseling this road that was made out of marble, and falling over it into this gorge with this rushing river. It's just, that's just life. Uh, and when you see the daily life of people, uh, I will say another thing about New Delhi. There was a, uh, what they call, um, I'm not sure I'm in Bali, what do they call the government stores? Um, 
okay, whatever it is, they're government stores, and they have these costumed people out there with the, with the implement, the juggle, whatever it was. And then on the ground in front of them, all well, these people were just lying on the ground, sleeping or dozing or whatever they're doing. And then you go inside the store, and they're just hanging. The gold is just hanging <coughs> off of this. Um, I, we were in Varanasi one day, and by the end of that trip with that terrible guy, and he just had his fingers in the window. And I said, well, thank you very much and goodbye. I'm sure when I come back, we'll all be eating each other. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing now? Because I know you're still painting. Maybe to wrap up, we can, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit about what you're doing. Well, um, uh, at, at the moment, it, it is hard because uh, my husband died this year. Mm -hmm. And so I had to contend with his illness. And I was so crazy about him. He made every single thing possible for me. Everything. And uh, my best friend and my companion for 67 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the losing of him and watching him go was extremely difficult. So I decided that uh, if I was going to do anything, I was going to do another bigger painting about uh, family and uh, not only about family, but memories. Um, I wanted to do the Picasso ladder. If you remember, he always had a ladder, and he had a minotaur and walk with him. He had all these things, and he had these, these things he took with him wherever he went. And the ladder, I thought, was very important for me because I'm middle. In order to get to any of these paintings, I have to go on two ladders, one for each foot. <laughs> and then I have to get up to the so the latter is included. And then Burma, uh, going to Burma and uh, seeing the plains of Pagan is the most unbelievable, outstanding, and not many people have gone there. I guess they more and more people are going to go, but uh, it was so outstanding that I decided to rent a cart and go back out there at midnight because there was a full moon. It's a thousand temples that sit there, unused, and just sitting there, and it, they look white, and they look almost uh, mysterious, they look definitely mysterious. <coughs> it's just a scene in the um, It just, uh, put, putting some of that in this new painting, um, I don't know, we're just trying to you know, figure out how it's going to go. Incidentally, painting and resolving the painting is definitely from that piece. If you turn the Matisse upside down, sideways, or any old which way, it's resolved. You wouldn't do another thing to that painting. And that's the way it should be. Also, to look in the mirror and see where to go with your painting. It tells you <coughs> where to go. So, uh, little technical things that are interesting. So I am working on that big painting. Are there any other questions? So I see that you focused, at least with this show, mostly on painting while painting. And with the people on you said you started with watercolor. Are you? Never. No. I <laughs> finished that long ago. You know why? It's too hard. The upper medium being a good watercolorist is very difficult. Are there other museums that you've tried? Oh yes, I tried acrylic, and acrylic flattens out. And uh, I did a lot of acrylics, but I don't like that either. So I really love the texture of oil. And I always uh, have done, and in the red painting you can see it, where I would um, hack in some um, pastel to give it a, a zip, or some charcoal to give it a, an extra little marking. So uh, I like that. I, I, there are a number of things, but I like oil paint. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you work on paper with oil paint. Uh, most of these are on paper. Yes. That's <laughs> well, one of the reasons is uh, a canvas this size is pretty heavy for me to turn.
turned upside down and pegged sideways and pegged upside down. It's heavy work and then you've got to have it on an easel. And so this way you put paper up and you pin it to the wall or tape it to the wall and you pull it down. You can, you know, lay it on the floor. You can walk on it. And do it. <laughs> you, you've touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about color? Well, I love color. Obviously. I love color. And I do think that certain things require a certain color. This painting here is a portrait of the inner soul. And I think that it required exactly what I wanted out of that. And the same thing with the hot house. Just the name alone inspires you to lose a brilliant color. And uh, uh, what can I say? I love color. And the layers. I mean, for instance, in this work, I mean, the way the colors are layered, they can, are almost iridescent. And that's the way I read it. I don't know. Well, you know, one of the things is, um, my father had blue eyes. My mother had blue, <laughs> blue eyes as well. And uh, there was something about blue in the family. Uh, and just uh, everybody, all of us like blue. And so I use blue a lot, as you can see. Um, and at the same time, I, I think the introduction of a subtle color scheme uh, seems to work. But I don't like raw color. I have to say, there are a number of artist pieces that uh, are really uh, fairly ugly when you look at them, when you look at the real paintings. But they reproduce exquisitely. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time, what we're looking at in the studio is work that is reproduced. And consequently, I'm not saying the work is ugly. I'm a big fan of Joan Mitchell, of course. And, uh, but I have seen the work in that, and I've seen it in the Harris, and I've seen it in the um, And it's very raw. Uh, and uh, I know part of that is because of her life. Her, her life was not an easy, easy life. But in the reproduction, I certainly think the work is gorgeous. And, uh, and so it's beneficial sometimes just to look at a reproduction for your own purposes. And her color schemes are all just beautiful. There is one person, I'll just say this, there is one person whose work, a living artist today, whose work is so important to me that almost everything I have done within the scheme of the mountain paintings is its own people. And Anselm Keaton uh, was born as uh, soon as World War II was over. He was born in the eastern sector of uh, uh, Berlin, not Berlin, but the eastern sector of Berlin. His, uh, his ability rests upon a monumental, as big as the Himalayas, his ability is packed with information. It is packed with Kabbalah mysticism, mythology, literature, poetry. He is a, a holder of the most astounding amount of information <coughs> of anybody I know. And his paintings are super. They are so, uh, it's like stereophonic sound. It's like you're, you're walking into the painting. They are gigantic. These look minuscule next to his. Some of his paintings are three stories high in the museum. The business of looking at the sea that he is painting is that you see it, you feel like you are certainly in it. Uh, he has, for me, become my real mentor. It's what I and what I would love. I have two two things. Do I wish I had done it, and do I want it? And both of those things apply to Anselm Kiefer's work. His paintings. Anybody who's interested in finding out about him, there's a million books. <laughs> but, uh, thank you so much.